Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The next unit we are going to learn is fluids. Uh, but before we can actually talk about fluids, there are two main types of fluid categories, hydrostatics and hydrodynamics. The first category we're dealing with, of course, is hydrostatics, which simply means about fluids that are staying still. Hydrodynamics, on the, on the other hand, of course, means fluids that are moving, but we're going to deal with staying still first. But before we can actually talk about um, some hydrostatic formulas, I want to talk about an old chemistry equation, which is, of course, density. If you guys remember, back in chemistry, you guys probably had to do a density lab. So let's just recap the density lab quickly. In the density lab, you probably had some sort of random object, which you then had to find the mass. Then afterwards, you find the volume. If it was an easy object to measure, you could use like length with height over the circle. However, if it was an irregular object, the easiest way to measure the, ma the volume of the object was to place it, of course, in fluid. And you could then measure exactly how much fluid went up. In this case, 9 milliliters, which we will convert over to our units in a minute. And based on the, knowing the mass and knowing the volume, you were able to solve for the density. So if we would just look at that again one more time, the mass of this object was 11 grams. We convert that to kilograms, so that's 0 0.011 kilograms. The volume of the object was 9 milliliters, which if I convert that into meters cubed, which is our unit for volume, you would get 9 times 10 to the negative third meters cubed. Hold on, sorry about that. Negative 6 meters cubed. Okay. And if you were to divide those two numbers, of course, density ultimately gives you the equal to mass over volume. And if the object was more dense than the water, it would sink. If it was less than the water, dense in the water, it would float. In this case, we can see that the object is less dense than, is more dense than water because it fell in. Okay. Now, the symbol that we now use for density, however, is not D. We're going to use the Greek letter rho. It kind of looks like a curvy P. So basically, density is equal to mass divided by volume. Okay. And we're going to be using that a lot later on just make sure you keep that formula in mind. If I want to do one quick practice question with that, what is the density of a 200 kilogram box, sorry, 200 gram box with a side length of 10 centimeters? So the mass would be 0 0.2 kilograms. Volume would equal to length times width times height. Now make sure you convert centimeters to meters before you plug it into the formula. So it would be 0.1 meters, or really in this case, since the cube, cubed. So 0.2 kilograms would be the mass. The volume is 0.0001 meters cubed, and your density would ultimately probably equal to Let's see, 0.2, 0.001, sorry about that, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 200 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. The only density that you need to memorize, however, is the density of water. The density of water, let's just cross this out for a moment. In chemistry, you learned it to be 1 gram per centimeter cubed. For physics, however, we don't use grams or centimeters. So it's going to be 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which means that this box above will, of course, float on top of the water. And we'll talk about the box floating more later on. The next part we should talk about is pressure. Okay. What exactly is pressure? Now, when you think about forces, we've, we've dealt with forces before, but it 
it's a little bit different than the idea of pressure itself. You see, pressure is defined as the force applied to a specific area. Meaning, if I were to take this pen, for example, okay, this pen has two different points. At one point has a larger surface area, the other point has a smaller surface area. So if I take use this pen and apply a force to my hand, I'll feel a certain pressure. But if I turn the pen around to the other side and apply the same force, it hurts a lot more. There's a lot more pressure because there's a lot smaller area. That force is concentrated over a smaller area. So the formula for pressure is P equals to F over A, force applied to a specific area. And based on the formula itself, the unit for this would be Newtons per meter squared. So keeping this formula in mind, let's take a look at this example over here of a person wearing snowshoes. This person is able to walk on top of the snow. But how is that possible? Well, basically because the snow might be soft, but his weight is now distributed over a larger area than before. And since it's distributed over a larger area, the pressure is less, so it's not enough to actually penetrate through the snow. So when we talk about P, equals to F over A, with a larger area, you have less pressure. The force, of course, being the person's weight. If you look at this next example, there's a physics teacher who's brave enough to be laying on a bed of nails. But he's not punctured. Why is that? Well, individually, one nail will have very, very low surface area. So if you put your entire body weight onto that one nail, then there's gonna be enough pressure to actually penetrate through the skin and go in. But over an entire bed of nails, where there's lots of them and lots more surface area, the pressure is, the force is evenly distributed, so therefore there's a lot less pressure. If we actually take a look at this problem over here, Exer estimate the pressure exerted on the floor by 50 kilogram Jamie Schiffer, who is standing momentarily on a single spiked heel, and compare it to the pressure exerted by a 1,500 kilogram elephant. All right. Now, first of all, I gave you Jamie Schiffer and her weight, and she's standing on one foot. So let's kick one foot up and one foot down, and she's standing on one foot. Her weight, of course, is 500 newtons. The area was given as 0 0.05 centimeters squared. Of course, we don't use centimeters. We use meters. To convert to meters squared, normally to convert from centimeters to meters, you divide by 100. To convert from centimeters squared to meters squared, you divide by 100 twice. So if you divide that twice by 100, you get... 5 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared. So if we now actually take the time to calculate her pressure, the pressure is equal to 500 newtons divided by 5 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared, which would equal to which would equal to 1 times 10 to the 8 newtons per meter squared. 100 million newtons per meter squared. If we compare that to an elephant now, okay, if an elephant were to stand on your foot, you might think that might hurt a lot more compared to if Jamie stood on your foot. But if you calculate it out, the pressure exerted by the elephant, who has a mass of 1,500, that's so a weight of 15,000 newtons, divided by an area of 800 centimeters squared, so that's 0 0.08 meters squared, would equal to 187,500 newtons per meter squared. A large amount, 
but not nearly as large as Jamie Schiffer. If Jamie Schiffer were to actually stand on a single heel foot and stand on your foot, it would be enough pressure to actually penetrate through you. I mean, why do you think it's so hard for a girl to walk across the grass in high heels? Because every time she's walking, she's literally poking a hole down into the grass as she's walking across. Anyway, so if we go back to, let's see, over here, okay. So what does pressure exactly have to do with fluids then? Okay, we've, we've defined density, we've defined pressure itself. What exactly is so special about fluid pressure? Now, fluid pressure, there's a couple things that are special about it. First of all, is that the fluid surrounds an object on all sides. So pressure, with fluid pressure, pressure is exerted on all sides, okay, and the pressure level, the pressure amount is exactly the same if, if you're at the exact same depth, okay? So pressure is constant at a specific depth. The reason the second point is so important is because we use hydraulics to do the most amazing things keeping in mind that pressure always stays the same at specific depth. And right, our first example here is a car lift, okay? The way a car lift works is that you have a force being applied at one side and a much larger force is applied on the other side automatically. Well, that's simply because according to fluid pressure, we know that the pressure here and the pressure there must be exactly equal. P1 is equal to P2, okay? But they have different area sizes, different piston sizes. So if I actually wrote it out as F1 over A1 equals to F2 over A2, I can see that there's a lot, if I increase the area of the lift, I automatically increase how much force is being applied because there's a lot more water over here that's applying that upward force due to the pressure that exists over there. If we were to actually solve this as a problem, okay. In a car lift, compressed air exerts a force on a piston with a radius of five centimeters. So if I were to draw this out, just like the picture we saw before, we have the first piston and the second piston. First piston has a radius of 5 centimeters, which is equal to 0 0.05 meters. And the second one has a radius of 15 centimeters, or 0.15 meters. So how much compressed air, or how much force must it exert in order to lift a car that weighs this amount? Okay, so there's a car over here how much force would need to be exerted downward on one side to exert the other force on the other side. So as long as we understand that the pressures are equal, P1 will equal to P2, then we know that F1 over A1 will equal to F2 over A2. So if I write this all out, F1 over pi times 0 0.05 squared is equal to 1.33 times 10 to the fourth newtons over pi times 0.15 squared, okay? Notice there's a pi on both sides. I'll cross that out first. And if I do just a little bit of quick multiplication, you get 1,477.78 newtons, okay? A lot less force to lift a heavy car due to the power of hydraulics. We say hydraulics um, whenever you talk about brakes in a car. 
Have you ever wondered, or even brakes in uh, your bicycle? Have you ever wondered how your brake pedal in the car works? Well, when you push down on the brake pedal, what it's really doing is it's pushing on a tube of liquid. So therefore, the force being applied when you push down automatically transfers the force to where the um, where the car to the tires are, and the clamps close down onto the tires, um, forcing the tires to slow down. But let's talk a little bit more about fluid pressure, okay? When we talk about fluid pressure, I want, as I said before, pressure is being exerted from all sides. Literally, it's as if the weight of the water above the box were all pushing down and compressing onto that box. And not only the weight of all that water above, but there's also air outside the box that's adding on to the pressure as well. In fact, if we were to look at look, take a quick look at this model over here. Okay, we have a pressure sensor, and we can see the deeper and deeper we go, the more the pressure increases. Now. One quick note over here. Notice that they say that their pressure is in ATM. And you guys know the standard pressure, when we talk about STP, we standard pressure is one ATM. But we don't use ATM in physics, we use Newtons per meter squared. So the quick conversion would be that one ATM is the same thing as one times 10 to the fifth Newtons per meter squared. One ATM is 100,000 Newtons acting on one meter squared, okay? Anyway, so when the sensor goes deeper and deeper and deeper, there's literally more water on top forcing down onto that sensor, which is why the pressure increases as you go down. If I go out of the water, even if I go out of the water, I, my pressure never reaches zero. It reaches one. What exactly is that one? Well, that is the pressure of the outside air. So even when you're outside, there's still air right now pushing on that sensor. But when you move that sensor into the fluid, you have the fluid pushing onto the sensor plus the air pushing down onto the water and it's all squeezing down onto that sensor. So the formula that you guys should be writing down for pressure is P equals to PO plus rho G H. PO stands for atmospheric pressure, which of course, as you guys know, is 1 atm, or 100,000 newtons per meter squared. And rho G H is the fluid pressure. Now I'm going to rewrite this again later, but all together you create a total pressure, which we, as we can see in this example over here. Now, before I actually write out the formula itself, let's just take a look at a couple of different examples about how strong this pressure really is. I'm sure you guys may have seen lots of different submarine movies where somehow the submarine loses power and it starts sinking. In this example, in this YouTube example over here, they're just showing you the different compartments inside the submarine. The submarine is designed to withstand high pressure. It's designed to go deep into water. But even a submarine has its limits. So if it loses power and goes down, in this case it's sinking down, down, down. I'll fast forward a little bit. Eventually there's going to be a point where the compartments can no longer withstand that pressure and the entire thing caves in and eventually breaks apart. Even with us being in air, air itself exerts a huge amount of force on us from all sides. We just don't really realize it. In this example, we have uh, a steel drum that's heated and then cooled. 
Now, the reason it's being cooled is to lower the pressure inside as much as possible. Uh, but when you lower the pressure inside, I'm just going to pause this. Well, I'll, we'll watch. What happens is the air pressure is still on the outside. Well, it will actually crush the steel drum in. Pretty crazy. Now, normally you might ask, why didn't the steel drum crush before? I mean, right now, I mean, everything is being surrounded by this 100,000 newtons per meter, per meter squared. Why exactly aren't they being crushed? Well, if you take a look at the steel drum, the fact is, yes, there is air pressure pushing on the steel drum from the outside of 1 atm or, or 1 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. But there's also air inside the steel drum, which is pushing out of the same pressure, 1 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. And ultimately, those two pressures are going to cancel each other out. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual formula for fluid pressure. You have P equals PO plus rho GH. The first P means absolute pressure, which is just a fancy way of saying the total pressure. And when I say total, it's really the total pressure of the atmospheric, which is PO, which we also know to be 1 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared, that's a constant that will be given to you, plus rho GH. Rho, well, this is still, rho is equal to density of the fluid G, of course, is gravity. H means depth, meaning measured from the top of the water itself. So rho GH is the fluid pressure also sometimes called the gauge pressure. So if you take a look at our um, animation from before, okay, so outside we have air pressure. All the way up at the top, we have air pressure. Inside, we have air pressure plus the fluid pressure. So right now, this value over here is the absolute pressure. So P is equal to PO plus rho G H. Now, since this is an ATM, so I'm just going to use ATMs for now. That means outside, we have one ATM pushing down. So 15.51 ATM is equal to 1 atm plus rho gh, okay? That means that the total fluid pressure has to be 14.51 atm. And notice that as we go deeper and deeper and deeper, as the depth increases, the pressure is increasing and increasing and increasing. And as I said before, the fluid pressure ultimately is caused by having the entire weight of the water above pushing down onto the sensor over here. So it's all pushing down onto this. So if you think about it, rho GH, that makes perfect sense. If the fluid was more dense, it would be heavier than before, which would increase the pressure acting on it. If you went to a different planet and the gravity were increased, that would also increase how much pressure was acting on it. Or if it increased the depth, there would simply be more water on top pushing down. Okay, So the formula is P equals PO plus rho GH. Let's do a quick practice problem with that. Okay. What is the absolute pressure on the bottom of a swimming pool, 22 meters by 12 meters, whose uniform depth is 2 meters. So if we were to sketch this out, 
let's see, let's make this into a Q. Okay. So if we're looking for the absolute pressure inside the pool, that would simply be P equals to PO plus rho GH. So P equals to PO plus rho GH. PO, of course, as I said before, is 1 atm, or 1 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. Plus rho, the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. This is a value that you will eventually memorize. times gravity, times the depth. So we're talking about depth measured from the surface. The depth, of course, is 2 meters. And if I take all those values and I combine them all together, we end up with 100,000 plus, let's see, 20,000. So it becomes 1.2 times 10 to the fifth Newton per meter squared. Okay, and that's the total absolute pressure. Now, the thing is, if for some reason this scenario, the swimming pool were covered with a lid of some sort that was airtight, okay, if you put a cover on top of this pool that completely blocked off the air from hitting it, then we would not have included PO. Okay, but because it was open to the air, we are going to include air pressure in our calculation. As a quick follow-up question, <clears throat> okay, I also want to know how much force is acting on the bottom of the pool. Now, if we go back to the pool and take a quick look at the diagram, Okay. They said that the pool has a bottom, the area of which is 22 meters by 12 meters. So if the area is 22 meters by 12 meters, the area is 264 meters squared. Now we know the pressure already, which we calculated, so therefore if we use a formula, P equals F over A, F is equal to 1.2 times 10 to the fifth times 264, which equals to 3.17 times 10 to the seventh newton, a very, very large number.